Welcome. Uh, now, this is a very, very wide-ranging discussion that we're embarking on this afternoon, and it's really uh, examining the effectiveness of, of an issue that kept coming back to us, Lynn, you'll be aware, but as, we did, as we did all our early hearings around uh, tax, and I think we just wanted to have a more sort of systemic approach to our work, and this is our first attempt to do so. So I'm going to start, uh, it's very difficult to know where to start, and I've got lots of members, lots of interest, and no doubt it'll be very wide. Spread. I'm going to start asking you to focus on where I think there's the greatest interest, which, which is tax expenditures. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how many there are? Uh, I know the value of the tax expenditure. Now, how which, many are there? How um, many different tax expenditures, which is... Let me see if my interpretation is the same as yours. Tax expenditures where you introduce a change to uh, encourage a behavioural change in some way. Well, that, How many of them are there? There's, um, there's about £101 billion pounds worth of How relief. many? There will be, I, I think when the OTS looked, they looked at about 159. Um, of they looked, yeah, but how, well, I mean, we have figures, I, there's a figure in the report of 1,100 tax reliefs, or yeah. over 1,100 tax reliefs. It's, all, I, I, it's, it's a different question on the value, it's just how many are there? How well, many? Well, OTS looked at about 159. That's not our answer to the question, is it? No, but, well, what I was going to try and explain is that, that all of these definitional issues are slightly soft. Um, and so if you look at the report which NAO have done, they've done some international comparison. But one of the challenges there is none of us quite uses exactly the I same. I deliberately used your terms. So you yeah. talk about tax expenditure yeah. as being, and I think it's a useful for, from the point of view of this particular committee, because yeah. obviously we're looking at value for money for expenditure, so I deliberately use that term, yeah. which is yours, to try and establish how many there are. So your definition, the moment, uh, your definition. So if you looked at around 150, no, I could. I want yeah. you to look at all 1,100 or 1,000. So about 150 of those would be the definitions we apply to tax expenditure. I can give you the broad headings. So there's a clutch under income tax, which would include a significant number of pension schemes, um, small things like the seafarers' earnings deduction. Uh, there are corporation tax ones, uh, capital gains tax, inheritance tax, value-added tax, and then there are some smaller ones. Now, ironically, now, value-added tax is one. We talked about this a little bit before you came in, which I wouldn't call a tax expenditure. No. Because that's where you and that uh, decide going. not to have a tax rate because you don't want people to pay, yeah. which that, is a very different issue. That, but that, that's that actually example. is an important point because, I mean, one person's tax expenditure can be another person's uh, tax relief um, could explain be another person's that too. tax that. allowance. Well, it, these things tend to merge into each other. They are very much in the eye of the beholder. Um, I mean, for example, I remember in the old days... Um, I'm well, looking you, puzzled you, because you can, I'm trying to use... H, yeah. I'm trying for simplicity's sake to use HMRC's own definition. They talk about tax expenditure, so I was just okay. interested to know. So, I mean, I wasn't trying to make up a term, Nick, or, uh, and it just seemed to me the definition was, I can perfectly see, yeah. you know, if you put a personal, yeah. um, a, 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 a personal allowance, is a policy saying, we don't want you guys to pay under £10,000 or whatever it is. That's a, that's a decision around the line. An expenditure, which yeah. and we're pretty interested in this committee in expenditure, is one where you say, we're going to do this, the great one we've talked about is film tax relief, we're going to do this because we think it'll change behaviour. Yeah, so we're, we're slightly more purist than some other countries, and we do put VAT, zero rate and reduced rate, into that 101 billion of tax expenditure type reliefs, and other countries don't. So if you look at the 101 billion... Um, the big headings in it are 37 billion of it is zero rated VAT, um, uh, 5 billion is uh, reduced rate VAT, which is mainly domestic uh, re relief on domestic gas and electricity, 34 billion of it is uh, the relief on pension schemes, and 10 billion of it is exemption on capital gains on main homes. So 86% of the sum we're talking about. I think is in the field where, if I'm honest, I think most people would look at that and 
think of it as more like the structural reliefs you mentioned, like personal relief. Uh, about 15% of it. Why do you call them? Why do you call them tax expenditures and just um, interest? Because what's these purest are, about that? Uh, well, I, I because. France, for instance, doesn't put the yeah, but zero why is it purist to do so? Uh, because I think we've tried to capture the widest range possible in this space um, on the basis we do accept that um, uh, reliefs uh, and tax administration is of interest to people. So uh, it isn't a completely um, definite international definition. Um, and I think with all of these... Um, the question about what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it is a matter of some definition. I think NAO accepts that in, in the report. And certainly there are strong encouragements, you know, not to use the international comparisons too lightly because you can be classically comparing apples and pears. I, I, I totally respect HMRC's historical uh, focus on tax expenditures. I think conceptually... It is useful to um, uh, have something called tax expenditure, and at the margin, you know, tax expenditures can merge into um, public spending, especially around the sort of um, tax credit space. But when I look at these things, there are genuine grey areas. I mean, you used the example of using a tax relief to incentivise behaviour. The current uh, coalition has recently reintroduced a relief for marriage. Now, is that, um, is that a, a, an allowance which is designed really to uh, encourage people to go off and get married? Or is it just a value judgment that um, married couples somehow should have a slightly lower um, tax uh, burden? or should be relieved of rather more tax. And I, don't, I, I can't remember offhand whether this counts as a tax expenditure or a conventional allowance, but I hope you'll understand that there is some ambiguity. It just, I, I hear what you say. I mean, what, it's rather puzzled me because I had taken the, the, the narrower view of tax expenditure as being mm. really the ones to change behaviour. And the reason it puzzled, worries me then about, uh, and we'll get to some more specifics, it, uh, about behaviour is that why, why it worries me is that if we are to test the effectiveness of your policies, uh, you know, do they meet the purpose to which they were intended, which is what we're here to do, it'd be useful to know um, how you define that. And I thought it was quite neat to say where you're trying to change behaviour, we can then test have you done that? So, have you know, has the uh, or you ought to be able to test have you done something? So when you introduce a film tax relief, does it um, does it mean more films were made here, or does it become? We'll come on to avoidance and evasion in a minute, but yes. does it lead to that? And I, it, it just puzzles me a bit that you, your definition is so opaque that I'm not sure you can then test the effectiveness. And not testing the effectiveness of policy is a huge concern, particularly where you're talking about literally billions and billions and billions of pounds. But I mean, I would, where I would, um, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of those points are, are very, very good ones. But just um, drawing, drawing on my own experience of, of working around a tax area for the last 30 years, I've seen a number of governments come and go and a number of different chancellors come and go. Um, and you have no doubt seen the sort of annual theatre of, of, of the budget speech. Um, and that involves a whole series of announcements. Um, often um, the objective of tax policy is, is really very broad indeed. It's not some specific targeted um, thing. It may just be a reflection that the government of the day regards this activity as rather more uh, worthy than some other activity, and so therefore decides to tax it less. Um, you know, actually, it's quite rare uh, to have policies which you know have very detailed objectives um, set out. And that, I mean, that just that reflects. I mean, taxation is the most political of activities. Um, you know, it goes back thousands of years, and the House of Commons came into existence because of taxation. And um, 
I don't think it's something which you can reduce um, to the same sort of clarity in terms of um, objectives as, as many areas of public spending. Well, I just think, you know, that's true because it's, it's so complicated. There's some truth in that, but there's also some truth in what I said, Nick. And I, you know, I've been there in, in, with both on this side of the, you know, as a parliamentarian and as a minister. And you know, if I, I can take endless instances, let's take the game tax relief, which this government brought in, which we were lobbied about, you know, uh, 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 when uh, in a previous government. And the I, there was a completely clear purpose behind it. The purpose behind it was to provide additional support. Uh, to the games industry to, so that we maintained a competitive edge. We kept the games industry here and they didn't disappear. I can't remember to New Zealand or wherever it was that had, or Canada that had a much uh, 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 more benign tax environment, whatever. So it was a perfectly clear purpose. And when you're talking, and there, I accept that there are some, you know, that you can say personal tax allowances is completely and utterly and totally a political decision. And, and we, would, we would not attempt to comment on that, but there are others where there is a specific policy intent. And I then think it is up to this committee, as the Public Accounts Committee, to say, okay, you had that policy intent. How much did it cost you to put it in? How much have you gained in terms of, you know, is there more games industry here or more films done here? And how much has it cost you in abuse? And I think those are really important legitimate questions in areas where we're talking about billions. So trying to sort of put it all into the, into the framework of some, which I accept, prevents us from looking at others where I think there's a real series of questions to be asked. Do you agree? Well, I think that's, that is a perfectly reasonable point of view. I mean, when it comes to taxation, um, you know, as, as an official, um, you know, my, my role is to obviously advise ministers on, on tax and then um, with Lynn's uh, help uh, to seek to implement those decisions. I mean, we do actually have quite good feedback loops in terms of, um, you know, is an allowance or relief costing as much as we expect? We've now got an independent Office of Budgetary Responsibility, which at least um, predicts impartially and, and independently um, the cost of that relief. So, using your example of film, which I think the first, the original relief was brought in in 1997. This is. This is something where there's endless iteration, you will remember, through the 2000s, because it's one of those very difficult areas which, um, you know, the, the well-advised um, would rapidly home in on as a way of reducing their tax liability. So there were several um, iterations where, on the one hand, the government, no doubt, um, the Treasurer, the Chancellor, no doubt encouraged by at least one department, which I think you were a minister at in the, in the 2000s, um, wanted to support you know, legitimate film activity. And then you would get um, uh, sort of tax advisors um, manufacturing um, avoidance products. You know, we began to get the feedback from the revenue about um, how... Uh, the relief was being abused, and then you know we try to make further policy changes. Obviously, if a government's keen to help an industry, sometimes it's a little reluctant to to sort of go into reverse gear too quickly. But I do think over a period of time we've ended up with a tax relief for the film industry, which is which is more effective than the one which was introduced in 1997. That's not because we've suddenly, you know, we were all stupid back in 1997. It's actually, you, you learn yeah. um, by how reliefs um, actually work in practice as opposed to in theory. And this is my last... Clarity on something you said, uh, Chair. Um, were you suggesting the OBR has a responsibility to review uh, these uh, uh, tax reliefs? I um, thought you were, but they I'm have, sure. I mean, is that right? Yeah. The OBR has a responsibility to forecast mm. tax revenues. So if an allowance or relief turns out to be costing a lot more, that should show up as part of the forecasting process, and that should happen reasonably quickly. 
but their responsibility, as in their title, doesn't extend towards the questions that Chair was asking no. around the efficacy of the actual relief. It no, absolutely, mean, absolutely not. They, they, it's the prosaic okay. issue of cost. Okay, okay. I'm going to ask one more question Thank on you. film tax and then I'm going to go to Gita, because mm. it's a, it is a good one, and there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a figure, figure 23 in the report, which demonstrates, because mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's, it's where my concerns are, lie around, mm. if I may use my mm. interpretation of tax expenditures, where I think there's mm. an intent to change, although I, I define it somewhat differently, I accept from More the way you've yeah. you find it. Yeah. So what happened here was we brought this in. The OBR wasn't around at that time, but we thought it was going to actually cost 30 million. That was the original cost figure that was put on it. Yeah. It's, if you look at this uh, chart, I mean, it, it goes up to nearly 700 million in 2005 6 It goes up massively, massively much more than, than any of us had dreamt when we first brought it in. Uh, you start, you, the Treasury Committee starts expressing concern 2000, I don't know why they left it so late, but they, two, I don't, 2002 3 so it had already been in from some time. Then by the time you take action, its years have gone by. So the concerns are somewhat, one, the work that was done before. How on earth could we have, all of us, got it so wrong that we thought it would only cost 30 million and then it zooms up like that? If it was open to tax abuse, why on earth didn't we design it a different well, way? You know, it was just 30 million. Was it officials or was it officials. the industry or? Officials. So, so if, if you take that example, I mean, I, I think it is... So it's, the, it's designing, and monitoring, exactly. and then taking action. So it's three if, years you, if you take that example, um, I, I think Nick is right that there was a clear policy intent, which is for government, not for us. Um, it, it was very evident around um, the old film relief from very early on that it was drawing in forms of behaviour beyond which Parliament expected. And I, I know you remember this period well, well yourself, uh, Chair. And so a number of steps were introduced. And, and I think it is right that it took some time. But this is the balance, which I think is the point that uh, I'd be keen to make, that, that this is not a simple something's good or it's not good. This is a movement towards something effective. And in the case of film, the two, by the time of the final changes in 2007, we have not seen any abuse of the new uh, film uh, relief, um, we believe at all. And therefore, after, I think, a difficult birth, I would give you that, we are in a position where the original intention of um, a, a number of governments to take some steps which would support British film have but actually been very successful. The effectiveness point is that to get to that point that you've just described, took 10 years and several oh, billion pounds. Uh, no, no, not According not, to this chart. Can, can I have a go at answering this one? Because I, I originally said it was introduced in 1997. It's much and earlier. It wasn't. Um, actually, the original scheme was introduced in 1992, and that allowed um, uh, revenue expenditure to be written off over three years. And, you know, that, that was... A, if, if, if I had to sort of describe what often happens with tax reliefs. This is a classic case study. So this was introduced in 1992. It wasn't regarded as generous enough, and it didn't have very much of an impact. So you get a new government comes in in 1997. It wants to be seen to be doing something far bigger for the film industry. You then introduce 100% first-year write-off, and um, suddenly uh, investors uh, see a chance and go for it. No. Why didn't you see that? Why didn't you see that, you see? Why didn't you? Why think, weren't you able to predict that? Well, I mean, look, the, the, I think officials are, uh, right. historically are always cautious um, about new reliefs um, because, you know, you went back, the very first point you mentioned in this hearing was, you know, that there were a thousand uh, reliefs and allowances out there. And um, every single one of them um, not only complicates the tax system more, but either individually or in conjunction with other reliefs, provides an opportunity for avoidance. Now, one person's avoidance is another person's incentive, so you need to be careful in, in terms of what language you use. But my, my point is that um, we would have um, been aware of risks back 
in 97. I can't remember precisely the extent to which they were identified in, in the advice at the time. But, um, you know, governments perfectly legitimately um, are prepared to take risks in these areas. And the question then is how you manage the risk. Now, look, in an ideal world, we'd have spotted this in 1998, 99, uh, 2000. I mean, actually, there was um, HMRC set up a specialist team of investigators in 1999, and um, uh, actions were identified thereafter. But it was only in 2007 when the whole structure of the relief was changed and um, the new tax credit was introduced that we seem to have um, ended um, this as an avoidance. Well, the chart answered mm -hmm. my, my point, really, with respect. I mean, the chart doesn't go back to 1992. I'm just talking about what we can yep. see. I mean, perhaps the NAO can tell us, what is the value, if you take the point uh, from 1999, which Nick just mentioned was the point when the, um, the HMRC appointed special investigators, it was already five times what was predicted then. This is, this is the first point on the line about there before it starts to really shoot up. But what's the value from, as it were, there in, when it's probably about 140, perhaps 150 million? It goes up here until it reaches about 630 or 650 and then goes down again to about 120, I guess, in 2007. What's the value of tax reliefs, um, tax foregone, represented by, um, by that... Uh, by that line on the chart from total? I mean, a couple of billion? It's in the order of two billion, yeah. Yeah. And well, it, 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 so, so what I'm saying is you, you, you got it right by, as you yourself said, by 2007, 2008, but it took two billion of giving out relief, a very significant proportion of, was not for the purpose designed by uh, the policy or the intention of Parliament. It cost you 10 years or, um, um, well, nine, 10 years, and, and, a couple of billion but that, to get look, to that point. But that's, that's fundamental. What would have happened it's during that period is that every year we would have published the value of that tax relief. It was open to ministers or to Parliament mm -hmm. to do something about it. I mean, the reality is that tax is not managed like public spending. And um, actually, it is quite different from. Nick, let me just put one. Let me, you, you, I'll just have to do one question, then I'll come. Because had this been a grant, right? You, oh, yes. could, you could run it either as a well, grant well, or you could run it as a tax relief. We chose at the time, goodness knows why, we were, probably because we were worried about <coughs> how would we choose the winners, we'd run it as a with tax relief. Had it been a grant, the world have got, would have gone ballistic well, a good this example, overspend. Exactly. I mean, look, on that, um, I mean, you do raise an interesting issue. I mean, you will recall individual learning accounts, which were closed down pretty quickly when they started. Um, oh, really? <coughs> Uh, I, I don't think so, actually. It took, well, it took about 12 months after the news of the world started well, writing okay, about it so before you called the But you're, you're identifying a line which is rising exponentially from 2000 through to 2005. Uh, just say, can I just pick up a point on this? On figure 17, it shows that you've got eight people with a total cost of 390,000 monitoring this whole thing. Uh, we heard in previous hearings that uh, this film relief was going to already finished American films, for example. I mean, surely it, you, the revenue should have been investing in enough monitoring resource to make sure this relief actually worked as intended. It's okay saying, you know, people saw a big hole and ran through it, but shouldn't, shouldn't you, your unit, have been making sure that it was only being used for what was intended? So I, I think there are two major issues here. One is that Parliament <coughs> remains the organisation which chooses what to do. Uh, and you're absolutely right, figure 23 starts in 1997. If it had gone back to 1992, it would have shown a period of relatively modest spend on support for films aimed at paying for the production of films. And the change that was made in 97 was to pay for production or investment. And the period from 97 to 2007, the relief was accessible via investment. And those were choices made after some lobbying as, as the legislation went through Parliament. Uh, and I, um, I think during that period, what was happening was, uh, if, I, if I want to um, put it that way, was a consequence of the policy choices made. So the change in 2007 was to change back 
to uh, a, a relief that was focused on production. Our challenge to you, Lynn, is it just took too long. I mean, I, you I, know, I was there on this one. It wasn't that people, that, you know, ministers or par their minister, parliament through its ministers were saying, oh, car car let's carry on wasting money on this because uh, we know it's being exploited and, and uh, uh, abused by uh, 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 a group of... Uh, ne'er-do-wells. Nobody was saying that. Nobody was putting pressure on you. There wasn't a political pressure to waste money, waste money in this way. So something else was going wrong, which, innate, which allowed us to go on for that long. And that's getting underneath it, back to what this committee is about, is well, the effectiveness um, of, 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 of these policies. Well, I, I think there is a broader debate about who's... Um, whose role it is to determine the effectiveness. But I would disagree with you. I don't think during that period um, there was um, a, a lack of knowledge or understanding. And indeed, if you look at the graph, there were a series of steps all the way through from 97 to 2007 where various restrictions were put in place. But each of those was made after some consideration from a policy perspective. And at the end of the day, HMRC implements the policy the government of the day wants it to. And, and I'm afraid I think so, that is the separation. Sorry, just going back to my question. Are you saying, therefore, that this unit you have with a handful of people always, throughout that period, only let through exactly what the policy said? I can see people shaking heads behind you. Um, I mean, because that's my question. It's you know, you, your job is well, not to still, decide the policy, but to police that it's done. We will go on to talk about tax avoidance. Yeah. You know, we still have a significant number of cases outstanding in the tribunal. They're all for the old film relief. Um, some forty-three thousand of those cases will receive a notice to pay under the new accelerated provisions. We think as many as seventeen thousand of those are to do with old film relief. Yes, okay. so they're not. They're not all decided. But they got um, through at the time. That's no, my no point. they didn't all get through. Oh, Many I of them that. are still okay. heading towards tribunals. Okay. So, um, you know, this is this is not um, a situation. Seventeen thousand. Did you say about seventeen thousand? That's, that's the backlog of, of cases. The old of the old film relief, not the new, remain to be determined. How, how many of those do you think will, will eventually go through a tribunal? Uh, well, I hope with the changes we put in place uh, through the recent budget that many more will be settled because we will be expecting them to be to pay up front and the advantage of delay, which has been one of the main reasons for holding on to those old cases, will disappear. We will change the balance of benefit in disputing. Are you suggesting they haven't been given the relief yet? No, not all of them. Not all well, of them. Well, they haven't paid the tax. tax. They, yeah. They've withheld... Um, tax that they okay. believe is to be offset okay. and we are disputing okay. Meg quickly okay. on this and then I'm going to Quito on a broader point. It's more of a general point but arising from this when you're setting up a tax relief how much behavioural input is there in tax relief? And I think of yes, the example in Ireland where tax relief was given on building hotels so now you can get a 59 euro room very easily which is great for the consumer but it's devastating for some of the businesses. It was over seven years so those hotels are hanging on because they're going to get the tax relief at the end of the seven years. So that's a long period, which yeah. is not going to enable behaviour change within that. So there's two questions in that, really. One, how much do you analyse at the beginning? And secondly, what's a good time frame for allowing government to make a change to the policy without yeah. having a big impact on yeah. the business? So, but two, I mean, two very good questions. It goes back to something the chair said a while ago. <laughs> we, we, we have a lot of collaborative input at the design stage of um, tax reliefs uh, and that is is clearly um, more so specifically yeah uh, and and indeed uh, with with other parts of government who sometimes understand a particular sector very well um, and that design area I think is an area where we would now focus our very best resources on as the chair put it on those types of tax expenditure which are more likely to be attractive to tax avoiders. And I, I didn't have a chance to sort of respond to your earlier point, but I think it's a very well-made point um, that some types of relief are more likely to be subject to um, attack. And we do put our best resources alongside policy colleagues at ensuring we design as well as possible. Um, and then that we watch that design as it builds. But to go to your second point, if you are trying to undertake behaviour change, I think you do sometimes have to allow a transitional bedding period when you actually watch to see what's happening. Is it having the impact you expected? 
and then uh, to move on. And then if you do have to legislate to change, we traditionally were quite slow to legislate. And again, one of the changes that's been made, I think it's called the Reese policy, um, is that we now have a system whereby we can announce legislative change with effect from the date of announcement or even retrospectively. So we've given ourselves more tools to respond, but it would be foolish not to wait to see sometimes whether what you were trying to achieve was so successful. And film would again, I, I'd have to say, despite, as I say, difficult birth if you like, nonetheless, there are many people in the industry who would now say that the finally design scheme has led to a huge resurgence in film of the type that was originally wanted, which is production in this country, activity in this country, and therefore wealth in this country. Is there a critical time period? Or is it, do you think I think it, it depends so from tax to tax. Okay, Gita. Um, I'd just like to touch on the issue of inheritance tax and figure 10 <coughs> in particular. Uh, in relation to the comments made about the feedback loops, I, I quite like that description of feedback loops. When you look at the figure 10, um, it, it appears on the face of it that you know, when inheritance tax revenue has gone up 10%, but the agricultural property relief and the business property relief has gone up by 160% and 200%. It looks on the face of it as if there is an issue there. But um, just, just the first question to Lynn Homer, really. Um, in terms of the compliance, I take it for granted that the resources are available to ensure that the compliance process is actually undertaken very carefully in terms of settlement of in any, in any inheritance tax claim for those types of reliefs? Yes, um, inheritance tax generally is, is um, a tax which catches the minority, not the gotcha. majority, and it's designed in that way. Um, and that enables us to focus our resources on a relatively small number of cases, a few percentage of cases. Uh, and what I think it would be the percentage of your interest? Sorry? What sort of a percentage would it be? Well, currently, inheritance tax generally catches about 4% of estates. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's about 16,000 estates at the moment. Um, and so we are able to track and identify um, uh, activity that's, that's underway. And, and it is an area where, you're right, we have... Um, deep experts in that area. I'm not one, obviously, you no, know no. that. But no, no, the question I have really was 4% of, of, of estates are, are, are caught, but what percentage of those estates will be subject to further inquiry as, as part of the compliance process? Well, it, it will vary, um, and you know from the conversations we've had with you here that we have tended to extend our range, really, so we will use some of our um, electronic data to watch for trends, um, so um, uh, you'll have seen in stamp duty we saw early a change to moving properties through a number of owners in order to detach it from stamp duty. Um, so we, we would use general data. We would sometimes use campaigns to signal as we are at the moment about second incomes that we're focusing and we'll move resources in and out of an area if we think there's a problem either emerging uh, or historic that we need to tackle. So, 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 so the point I'm trying to get at then, in terms of the distinction between monitoring a, a tax relief and the compliance, it is perfectly possible, therefore, that the compliance is, is perfectly in place in terms of inheritance tax. But in terms of a, po a policy position, which we don't want to touch on the policy implications, but if, for example, we're seeing a 200% increase in agricultural pop, uh, property relief at a time where there's no real increase in inheritance tax coming through, would that be something that would be reported to ministers as an area of interest for them? Yes, I mean... There is a regular dialogue on, on this. And um, I mean, just to give you perspective, yes, figure 10 shows that these reliefs have expanded, but the, the total cost of agricultural property relief is £370 million. Pounds. Business relief, £385 million. Pounds. So significant, significant amounts of money, but... Um, coming back to the Chair's point earlier about film relief, actually those reliefs, you know, relatively small, um, all things considered. And um, inheritance tax is an interesting tax because it, it really doesn't hit very many estates, but some very wealthy people put in a huge amount of energy into tax planning. And, I mean, these reliefs go back... Um, Decades. I think um, agricultural relief was introduced in the 1920s, yes. um, and I mean, for I mean, not do me, but this house, you have historically attached um, a very high weight to um, people with land and um, why they should shouldn't be taxed. 
I mean, Lloyd George tried to tax land at one point. But it's um, not cheap on my back garden. Is it really agricultural property? Well, um, uh, it might depend on how many sheep and what you do with them. It's, it's not my job to give you tax advice. <laughs> <laughs> But just, just on the specific point, as, yeah. as, a, as, as an MP who represents a yeah. rural constituency, of course I don't want to attack agricultural <laughs> property relief. Everybody has their self-interest. But the point I'm trying yeah. to get at is, is there are two issues. There's a compliance issue, which we are giving some assurance yeah. that HMRC are putting the resource in to make sure that things are in order. Yeah. But, but the, it's, the, it's the feedback process for decisions think, to be made at a political what, level that I'm interested in. I mean, you're, you're raising a really interesting issue because actually what you're really looking out for if you're in, in the Treasury, very much relying on HMRC's information and advice is a sort of inflection point where you know, something might be going up along like that, but if it something goes like that, um, then alarm bells should start <coughs> ringing. Um, so going back in time, uh, I'm sure this committee took an interest sort of around about 2004-05, there was this huge problem with VAT, MTIC fraud. Carousel fraud. Yeah, carousel. Uh, carousel fraud. Carousel. And um, that was a classic case where actually if you're sitting in the Treasury, you suddenly saw um, VAT receipts um, actually not rising along with the economy. And we did a huge amount of analysis yeah. with, with the revenue and customs. And I, just to put your mind at rest, um, we, do we do take revenue risks incredibly seriously. The Treasury, once a month, has a meeting specifically on the issue of revenue risks, where we look across the board at um, information intelligence we're picking up, court cases which you know we just lost, to ensure that, um, as far as is possible, the revenue comes in. And when things start um, shifting, we are keen not only to get to the bottom of the facts, but also to advise ministers and enter into a dialogue over whether there should be policy change. And the disclosure system... Sorry. Well, the disclosure system, the data system, um, gives us much richer information than we traditionally had. Uh, and although it's not something we do every day, there are occasions when we act to change the regime uh, within days of having a disclosure so that a disclosure scheme effectively never gets launched. And, and, and that's exactly that space where we see something about to happen, we give feedback, um, although ministers are very loath to do it, that in occasionally includes retrospective legislation, more often includes immediate announcements that will kill uh, an artificial project stone dead before it's marketed. Amos, and then I'm going to go to um, Austin. I just think it's worth and, and, and commenting that, so, but in, in the ordinary way, if you were getting an upsurge in activity, apart from through a disclosure or something of that sort, or special sort of intelligence, it would mm. normally come from the tax return, upsurge through tax returns, which aren't really, where the data is not available until some time later. I and mean, it's not a particularly, but just as a matter of fact, that's true. So it's not as if it's sort of instantly every year people are sitting pouring over current information. That's, that's a little bit, I'm not sure it's like that. But just talking about the reactivity so presumably you would agree that it's entirely legitimate to look at how effective you're being in, in reacting as promptly as, as I know you want to. So that's something, that's a ground for perfectly reasonable inquiry and examination. Well, isn't it? I think it's something I've talked to you about quite often. So you take an interest in how effective our compliance work is. That's uh, a debate about uh, how mm. my department is spending its resources in fulfilling its functions. I, don't think you've found me shy about having those discussions. I mean, I, I think all I'm trying to distinguish is that, um, that, 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 that that doesn't necessarily, um, it's, not, it's not necessarily the same thing as, as determining whether what we're doing um, is a wise thing or not. That's you're often talking, someone else's no, that's decision. Actually, you're talking if that's about, what we've been asked to do, are we doing about, as well as we can? You're talking about a policy purpose, which of course we, we're not questioning. But, no. but, but what we could presumably do is, apart from compliance, we could expect to, to test how promptly and vigorously you go from picking up information to assessing whether the relief is still performing in the way that it ought to perform. That, that is a reasonable thing to be looked at in terms of how quickly and efficiently... I mean, you've described film tax relief and uh, the uh, delays, as, and, and, and the question is, 
say it would be a reasonable area of inquiry to say, well, did they do that as fast and effectively as they should have done? And the answer may be yes, but nonetheless it's entirely a reasonable area to examine, isn't it? Um, I, th I think it's a reasonable area to examine if you do it well, Amias, which That's I'm sure you will. Everything. Um, but just to pick up on one of the points you made, it's not always about being fast. Uh, just as I think in a proportion of the report you suggest it might be about a certain proportion of cost increase and again I would say that what you've got is a range of circumstances mm. which might lead you to decide that a relief um, is not performing as you expected it to do and that you have to do something else but I do think it's a case by case judgment and I suppose what I'm just trying to ensure is that people don't think there are easy or simple metrics that go you know, once X happens, Y should follow, because no, I think the system is more challenging. So Nick did say, if the chart starts shooting up almost vertically, if it's been doing this for a few years and suddenly shoots up like that, then it should be a flag. And that's exactly what has happened um, in, even in, in Figure 23. Cases. It shot up very, very rapidly indeed. And you came pretty close to saying it was Parliament's will and the policy intent that the chart goes shooting up like that. We've heard from one of the ministers, one of the people who was minister at the time who helped design the policy, that certainly wasn't the case. And what it looks like is it took several years to get round to reacting. That's, that is what it looks like. I understand that's what it looks like. Um, I wouldn't necessarily entirely agree with Nick that it would simply be a question of how quick a graph goes up. If the graph was a very small relief that was deeply embedded in the psyche of the country, we might still say worth monitoring, but not worth spending a really long time and a lot of money to evaluate. But, 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 but you're giving a different example. If, if, on, well, the other ha on, if, if on the other hand it were a relatively new relief which had been tweaked in a number of ways in order to achieve a particular intent and then it had shot up, it would be yep. a legitimate question to ask pretty early on, gosh, this has shot up, is it achieving the intent? And I've given you some examples. Uh, we have recently made some alterations to the CEIS, the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, uh, to limit its um, uh, 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 relief um, to move away from a situation where two things the government was doing, one around enterprise relief and one around renewables, didn't connect together in an unintended way. Um, that was a very fast response and very appropriate. What I was trying to say earlier is there might be others where you are, as, as uh, Make uh, mentioned, trying to undertake behavioural change. You might actually decide that you've got to let something ride for a little bit longer and actually work out what is going on before you react to ensure it's not an overreaction. So it's completely right to expect us to evaluate, but it's a judgment-led evaluation. Okay, I'm going to go to Austin and then Ian, but I'll just to finish this one, in the report it says... Out of the 92 reliefs that the NAO looked at, 26, the expenditure increased by 50% in real terms in 10 years. 30, expenditure increased by 25% in the last five years. Are you giving us the assurance today that that is monitored? It doesn't mean you get rid of them, but you have monitored all those instances. Um, yeah, we do a great deal of monitoring. Um, uh, have you monitored all those? All, I mean, that's some, of those, some of those 92 are very small. Um, and as I was saying earlier, the level of monitoring you would do in those would be very different than a big one that we, you were going through. We don't, um, we don't, we don't so just, we don't just monitor them. We publish evaluations um, every uh, March um, the cost of the principal um, tax expenditures and structural reliefs. And so, the minor ones. And it, so these things are out there, and if people don't like them, they can... They can do you make, look at them? Make I'm just asking a question. If yes. Do you look at them? Yes. You're but, talking about but, this sheet here with, um, with the numbers attached to some of them and yes. ne yeah. nedge, Nedged the negligible. Neg yes. If and those were, might be examples where we didn't do a great deal. If you were to add up all the nedges, do you know what you would get? Um, a, a negligible amount. I mean, well, I'd get... Well, nedge, well, nedge well, in my million day... There, million there, it might nedge in my day didn't round... It was anything which rounded to less than five million. So you'd have to be two and a half million or less to be... And, and of the right. when you say in, in your day, you're still <laughs> a permanent secretary. <laughs> but in, in the in day, when I, day when I produced the sheet myself. Right. I used okay. to do this, did you? Yes. <laughs> Austin, then Ian. Look, the report says on, uh, on that uh, point that the chair has raised that uh, the NEO identified 26 tax reliefs which had increased by more than 50% in real terms in the last 10 years and 30, which had increased by more than 
25% in the last five. Now, if that happened to a department's expenditure as opposed to a tax relief, Treasury would be jumping uh, down their, their throat. But the report says none of the increases prompted the Exchequer departments to evaluate the reliefs concerned. Well, there's, there's two things I would just really be keen to say. I, I, I think a distinction has to be made between evaluations we publish and evaluations which we share internally. And there is rather an assumption if something hasn't been published, it hasn't been done. And um, well, that would not be the under? case. The second thing is that, as we discussed earlier, a number of um, the reliefs captured in this definition are... Um, things which, by uh, your own discussion earlier, you would accept um, there's a kind of understanding of what's going on anyway. So a big chunk of one of those um, it relates, to, uh, two of those relate to VAT changes. And the understanding of the VAT change um, was, you know, is well understood by Parliament. And the change in the rate of tax will create a change in the value of the relief. And again, if it's well understood, we don't waste more money on understanding something we already understand. Which do these come under, these changes yes. caused by the NEO? Yes. The um, ones you discuss among yourselves are the ones that are published. Uh, uh, well, b both. So, but a number of the ones referred to in that paragraph are just the kind of reliefs we discussed earlier. They are zero rate tax, they're reduced rate VAT on uh, domestic fuel, um, <laughs> and, and largely the change in the cost of the relief relates to the change in the cost of the tax. But effectively, it means in granting those reliefs, Parliament, the Chancellor, is giving an open cheque. Well, the Chancellor has to account to Parliament very fully before he but makes is it giving an open cheque? Well, he's not giving an open cheque because he's always open to Parliament to, to, to change the, the tax. I mean, what is striking is if you, if you put up tax rates, you, you immediately increase the value of reliefs against that tax rate, similarly if you reduce tax rates, um, actually it reduces the, the value of the relief. I mean, it is interesting that, you know, historically successive governments um, don't have chosen not to manage revenue in the same way as they seek to plan and control public spending. I mean, that is a, uh, in a sense, a decision, decision by government, a decision by parliament. I mean, in principle, you could design a system where um, all these reliefs were managed in the same way as public spending. And could we design a system where somebody is accountable in the same way you have a, a, you, you could have do. I mean, on, no, I mean, on spending? I mean, I am, you could make someone, um, a, you know, you, an accounting officer could be responsible for tax reliefs in the same way as they were for public spending. But at present, they are not because um, tax, to use the term we started with, tax expenditures have always been um, regarded as different. But that's a major point we're making. Uh, let me ask you about one aspect of, uh, of reliefs, and that's the uh, uh, tax relief for companies on uh, interest that they pay on borrowings. Do we know... Uh, how much of that goes on borrowings used and spent overseas as opposed to borrowings spent in this country? Uh, well, the, the, the corporation uh, tax uh, amounts of expenditure structure are, are quite small. Um, so, um, uh, this is I mean, what is one shocking on your corporation tax? It's, uh, you know, 20% of the 800 largest companies paid no corporation tax at all, and a quarter paid less than £10 million each. That's pretty shocking. Now, part of the explanation will be what, it, what Austin is uh, alluding to. Um, but, if there's a broader issue there. You well, know, this, is, yeah. this is a tax that is not meeting the intent that was set by Parliament. I don't know what on earth you're doing about it, but well, it is certainly not meeting... If, you, if you've got... Out of your, your largest company, one in five, not paying any tax, corporation tax at all, and uh, one in one in four paying less than ten million each. It's not meeting the intent. Those those corporation tax generally will be uh, part of the structural taxation system, and as you discussed earlier, not an area 
specifically captured in the taxable expenditures. Oh. Uh, and so essentially the, the judgment there is what does the government of the day want to set as the appropriate tax rate? We've talked with you quite a lot about the application of those rules and um, they are a mixture of international, European and domestic rules uh, and we are um, of the view that there is uh, some avoidance around both um, interest uh, rate relief and sideways loss relief uh, but it is not predominantly uh, large corporations. Um, it's, it's a much wider uh, um, uh, uh, risk. Um, the, the basic question of where the threshold will be set is, is a policy area and one we've talked about many times as to uh, people's view of that but at the moment I'm content that we are applying those rules um, as they are intended to be applied. But not as other countries apply them. Let me just give you this example from uh, the UNITE report on Alliance Boots which was uh, uh, a leverage buyout which cost uh, nine billion on which tax relief is now being claimed for uh, taking over the company uh, and that tax relief uh, allows Alliance Boot which has had its headquarters moved from Nottingham uh, where you've got Nottingham University founded on the loot of the shrewd cash chemistry of good Sir Jesse Boot to Zug uh, where uh, Boot does no business uh, and it allowed them to reduce the taxable income by 4.2 billion uh, and avoid tax payments of nearly one billion. Now, uh, that seems to me somewhat doubt doubtful as a, as a proposition. How does HMRC ensure that the tax relief claimed on interest payments is restricted to the amount of debt used in this country? Well, you know I won't talk about individual tax uh, payers. We have this debate most of the occasions I come. Um, in general terms, we've talked to you as a committee through uh, our application of the tax laws to some multinationals. Very happy to offer a further session if you wanted specifically on both interest payments okay, and... Okay, well, let me stop you there then. But, sorry, if I just could finish. Yes. Um, I think um, we are also playing a leading role, and again, this is collaboratively with um, Treasury colleagues, in the international work that's going on around whether or not these international uh, laws um, would benefit from change to match the world we live in now. And I think we've shown ourselves to be keen to be part of that. So there is a question about modernising international tax systems to um, um, match the times, and I think um, this government and both of our officials are playing a role in that. Um, whilst that is going on, we believe we apply our rules well uh, and that they're well understood, and I'm very happy to have a more detailed conversation with one you about the specifics. Okay, well, I, I, I look forward to that, but just uh, one final question. In the USA and in Canada and in New Zealand, they have thin capitalisation rules in which the tax allowable on these borrowings is related to the capital base. In other words, uh, it's less uh, than here. Has this been considered in these discussions you're telling us about, which have gone on over interest pay, uh, the tax relief on interest payments? Every government makes choices about its taxes. Um, we have much more generous zero VAT on a wider range of products than most of our European counterparts. But has those are decisions, been those are decisions for Parliament um, and we do implement them. Um, uh, each country makes choices about what it taxes and what it doesn't. Within in the multinational sphere, within a great deal of international tax law as well. But you can't make choices unless you discuss it. Has it been discussed? We've said already we, we, our officials talk every day and they talk only about tax. Um, they are, they're not the most wide-ranging conversationalists, they're deep experts and that's what <laughs> so they So they might about. talk a lot about the capitalisation. Right, Ian. <laughs> um, yeah, just as a, as a postscript to, uh, to what Austin's been saying, figure nine, in fact, shows an example of, uh, of how this works. And just, uh, I think this is an example where I wonder the extent to which... Um, HMRC are measuring what's going on and, uh, and informing policy makers. It's back to that point we're making. Uh, because certainly uh, um, the, the tax director of one of the biggest companies in the world told me that moving the capital structures are the main way of avoiding tax. It's not 
transfer pricing and all the things we spend our time worrying about is actually the way they design their capital structures and move interest around. So it is very important. And um, the NAO diagram here makes some two uh, kind of interesting assumptions, one of which is that uh, the interest rates are the same on, uh, on the, the amount raised overseas and charged to the UK, which I think uh, typically is probably not the case when you look at some of the huge interest costs that are uh, levied by some businesses. And secondly, it assumes that the overseas subsidiary in the right-hand column is borrowing the money on the external market, whereas we know that many companies in the UK are setting up companies overseas using share capital from the UK in order to do this financing. So, um, so the, the idea that they're then paying interest on to other organisations overseas is also mm. often not true. So I, I don't even expect much of a response, but except that I hope you're measuring this and informing policymakers of what you can see going on inside uh, you know, yeah. their tax returns. Yeah, and we've, uh, we've talked to you a lot about avoidance um, and uh, I've, I've listed on a number of occasions the steps we've taken, but uh, in this area, to, again, to kind of illustrate what the conversations lead to, uh, we've a, a, a very wide range of anti-avoidance measures um, to counter misuse of interest relief. Um, those would uh, include uh, unallowable purpose rules, disguised interest rules, anti-arbitrage rules, transfer pricing, and control foreign company rules. So uh, we've gradually built up a, a range of rules which are designed um, okay. to deal with some of what you're talking okay. about. I'm sure we'll keep on returning to it. Anyway, the main thing I wanted to talk about was uh, simplification. Para 2.3 uh, talks about the responsibility that you both have in this area and ends with the interesting statement, whilst also making the system as efficient, effective, and as easy to understand as possible. Now, um, I think all observers would say that the UK system is probably the least easy to understand and the most complicated in the world. Uh, the Para, para 111 um, mentions the work of the Office of Tax Simplification mm -hmm. and uh, how they recommended 47 relief should be abolished it's an interesting comment. It says a representative sample of 155, suggesting that if you did a proportionate thing, uh, then a third of all, almost a third of all tax relief should be deducted if they actually looked at the other thousand and the rest of the 1,042. I'm sure that's probably not true. But anyway, they recommended 47 should be abolished. 48 have been abolished, but 134 new ones introduced. Um, Again, I'm not asking you to talk about uh, these rogue ministers who keep introducing new reliefs, but what, what, are you, what, what, what are you actually doing about the simplification agenda? Um, well, OTS, as you say, have been uh, a new um, creation of, of uh, this term of Parliament. We uh, support OTS's work, along with some Treasury colleagues, um, and we do support, uh, I think... One of, one of their, uh, so I think almost all of the um, ones they recommended should be uh, uh, abolished were. I think there were some that were partially uh, abolished. Um, but we also support their view that there's a great deal of work we can do to make tax simpler um, to interact with. And I think one of their conclusions in their final report was that part of this is not about making tax law simple, which actually no country has achieved, but making it easy for people to interact with it. And we are also it, undertaking it, work in that space. Can, can I just add to that? I think it's really instructive. They, they made all these recommendations to abolish reliefs, and I have in front of me the four reliefs which they, they recommended we abolished, and the government, having consulted, didn't abolish. One was land remediation relief. Another one was capital gains tax compensation for missold pensions. The third was late night taxes, whether those should be taxable or not. And the final one was a NIC exemption for awards for assistance with lost credit, credit cards. cards. And I, mean, I only mention that because it gives you a really interesting insight into how tax policy works. Those are all, I mean, you know, really sensible tax reliefs, but each one of them is just a further little complication yeah, yeah. to the system. Yeah. And, and there's, a, there's a terrible trade off here. I mean, the, the, the sort of idle official in me would just love to have a flat tax system where there were no reliefs at all, 
and we just had some simple tax raise. But understandably, you would regard that as unfair, and therefore you uh, pass these laws which well, Lynn has to make sense of. I think it's Hungary that has 16 I have to say that I, mean, I, think, I think getting rid of 48 and introducing 138 is hardly um, uh, evidence. All you can look at is the evidence. And if yep. you come in and you're saying you're going to simplify it, you introduce well, more than you had before, yeah. you're not. You're making it more complex. I mean, look at the length of finance bills. I can remember when, back in the 70s, finance bills were about 100 pages long. Now oh. you're lucky... You're lucky if they're not 500 pages. Peter yeah. wants a quick well, point on this, sorry, and I'll yeah. bring you back. I only in. got I, one more thing. I, yeah. I just a quick, a quick question, really, because I, I'm sure I've heard this before. But what are the resources available to the Office of Tax Simplification? Six people. Six Something people. of that order. And they're, it they're, is that and they're part time. Yeah. Um, it is not. Look, it's a new institution. Um, you know, future administra administrations may want to increase its role, just as people are arguing that the OBR should have a bigger role in relation to costing opposition policies and so on. So that is um, an option. Yeah. One yes, yes. Um, I'd like to finish uh, this point with um, Para 210, because you were talking about what the Treasury would like to see, perhaps slightly flippantly just now. Um, and, uh, however, in June 2010, the Treasury committed to developing a framework for introducing new reliefs. Um, here we are, nearly four years on, and uh, according to the report, we don't have it. So, what's going on with that? Um, Two ten. Um, Two ten. Yes, Two ten. I think. I mean, I think that it refers to a paper, tax policy making, well, a remember. new approach, yeah. June twenty ten. I do remember. It's referred to at the bottom. Uh, I mean, I think what's happened is that the government, in the end. Um, I mean, it, it, it's chosen not to introduce a framework, but it has done a number of things to um, make the system uh, work better. It's introduced um, what, what, are these, what are those things called? Well, first, Sunset clauses. First, it's consulted on um, it, it's consulting on legislation earlier, mm. and it's introduced things called T I I N S, um, which um, I should know what that stands for but that's it and these why cover these have far broader coverage than they have before why don't you just do principles uh, you know it, Nick, with your other hat on you know with your hat on of trying trying to i know you don't like to control it but you're supposed to have an influence on what all the departments do in expenditure you you expect them to to abide by managing public money rules why on earth don't you do that yourselves why don't you it's so obvious you look at options, you do all the stuff that everybody has to do for everything else. We don't do it on tax. Well, actually, no, we, we do. do. We um, do. Just, I mean, I would um, disagree with you. Yeah. I think a lot of the principles which inform so managing public you money. Don't. Well, it means it's not formally under the regime. Um, we don't, the sort of counting approach to um, tax relief isn't the same as public spending. But it, I mean, if Parliament wanted it to be the case, um, then. It, it, it might be different. That power also mentions... But, we, uh, but just to be clear, we yeah. do work together at every stage. So before design, at design, implementation, monitoring, evaluation... You always look at options, options you. Um, Sorry? You look at options. We look at options. We look at the impact. Um, we resource to risk. So, so we, don't, no options we don't evaluate as fully in every case because um, we're looking at the risks as they emerge. But... There is very, very close work, and I think we've particularly got better at designing better reliefs when we bring them in, so, which actually helps with that problem of losing something and having to get it back that Mr Baker was talking about. Can we just review the rest of that paragraph? Because I do think it's very fundamental uh, can, to what you, we're doing here. It's, okay. Um, specific um, points about designing reliefs, um, because when I was doing some preparation for this meeting, I spoke to some tax barristers who argued that one of the big problems we have is that uh, when legislation is drafted, we, we, we're almost guilty of second-guessing what tax advisors might do in terms of designing the legislation. So when we say that the whole tax system is complicated, it's complicated from the outset because we're second-guessing all the time. Is there any truth in that comment? Because when you say you're getting better at the design, that's the, the complexity or, the, or the, uh, the, the belief that there's complexity in the system. The argument is that it comes from the original drafting of the legislation. Is there any... Well, I mean, my... my my experience dealing with tax 
lawyers and tax accountants over the year is that everybody blames each other. We blame them. Uh, they blame us. And actually, there's a cycle. I mean, raising revenue is very difficult. People do not like paying tax, strangely. I mean, I do, obviously, but um, most people don't. <laughs> and I, I, mean, I regard it as an expression of citizenship. It is, is that people think um, it's yeah. really unfair. Um, really unfair that if you're rich or if you're a big corporation, you don't pay tax. No, well, but I'm just, I'm, just um, I'm, 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 I'm coming to that. Um, so what, what happens is um, ministers take perfectly sensible decisions. Um, Lynn, as people legislate in the finance bill, um, avoidance is a very is an increasingly productive activity. So therefore, I think we do legislate at slightly greater length than we did um, 50 years ago, and that's why the finance bill is four or five times as long because you are trying to anticipate actions by avoiders. But then the avoiders kick in, and they come up with. I mean, we've closed off many loopholes, but they'll come up with a fiendishly clever one. We then discover, and then we have another 100 pages of legislation. Now, every so often, the government comes along and abolishes a tax, and you take out a whole lot of legislation, but it's, it's hard work. The and very fact of adding more pages creates what a professor of tax at Harvard, when we visited Harvard, uh, called more points in the decision tree. Yeah. And he said... Uh, he, we were visiting Harvard when there was a symposium going on for people from the Big Four all over uh, in the U.S. And uh, he said the most depressing part of this seminar is when we get somebody from the Big Four along uh, and talk about who talks about the the, uh, the attempt by some big tax authority, whether it's HMRC or the IRS, whoever, to create an extra area of, of um, uh, regulation. And he said, "Oh, it's just we just add it to the decision tree. It just creates more opportunities to have more argument." and more delay, which is not cost-free. I mean, the 17,000 cases that you're talking about, have you tried to ev evaluate the, the cost of administrating all of those? Well, one of, one of the reasons for shifting to taking the tax at the point where we um, uh, have made our inquiries is to alter the balance of that cost mm. and um, to make it in the interests of the person who's participating in the scheme to come to a conclusion, mm. because we think there was cost both of time and money in the delay that the old system created. And, and the eventual outcome is not very productive. You've had tax avoiders in front of you, indeed, Chair. I think I recall one who truthfully answered the question to you that none of his schemes had been successful. Um, nonetheless, those people will persuade individuals to pay a fee to them to enter their scheme. They will persuade people to contribute to a fighting fund. Um, they've traditionally required some of those people not to settle with us. Now, we've introduced that as one of the triggers that would make a promoter a high-risk promoter now, if you require a fighting fund and you require someone not to settle. So this is, a, you know, a, a cat-and-mouse game, but I, I would slightly differ from Nick in saying that it's a productive game. I think it's mainly productive for promoters. I don't think it's as productive for the people trying to avoid well, It's productive tax. for everybody in the industry, the tax advice industry. I uh, think some of the highest promoters particularly make money from fees, not from the success the, the of the The government's scheme. policy is to have simpler, flatter taxes. I mean, that is the stated I government policy. I suspect, as Nick said earlier, both he and I might have an easier life if that were the case. But there it is are, government policy. There it are is, many. It is government policy, and actually, I mean... Um, as a theory... It is government policy. I mean, the extraordinary thing, actually, is how stable, how stable revenues are. You have all these tax changes yes. year after year, and actually, if you look at how much revenue comes in, it is extraordinary state. Yes, in fact, James Sproul was making exactly this point at a lunch I was at recently. He's the chief economist of the, I, uh, of the IOD, and he said exactly this, that when, when things are going really, really well, uh, you might might get it up to 35.5%. Exactly. Exactly. And when things are going really, really yeah. badly, it goes all the way down to 34.5%. Uh, exactly. And that roughly it's, it's around it, 35. It is. And now if you were interested in, in, in the effective and economic and efficient administration of tax, that would be your starting point, would it not? Well, it's, it's utterly fascinating. I joined the Treasury 30 years ago, and the taxes were 36.4% of GDP in, in that year. This year they were 35.5%. So almost exactly the same, but during that period extraordinary things have happened in the tax system the top rate of tax has come down from 60 to 45, VAT's gone up from 15 to 20 
you know, it's, um, it is extraordinary. You don't mean 60, you mean, eight, you mean 83. Right, I'm going to bring Fiona I was, in. I was feeling that she's been very yeah. patient. Fiona. Um, on Sorry. page 41 of the <coughs> NEO report, there's a reference... Sorry, 41? Yeah, there's a reference uh, to how uh, HMRC communicates with people who are affected by tax reliefs. So flyers were sent out about the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme. Mm -hmm. I got a letter on Saturday about a tax relief. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was very interesting. Uh, And it's a letter directly from the Prime Minister. It's not from you. It's not from one of your officials. Um, It clearly uses data, I assume, provided by HMRC. Um, And one of the things you, Sir Nick, said earlier is, as an official, my role is to advise ministers, and I'm wondering what advice you gave to Number 10 Downing Street about this letter. Uh, you know that I'm not at liberty to share the advice I give. Um, but you don't write to that for Fiona McTaggart, whatever you do. <laughs> the advice. <laughs> just um, I may have given that advice. Um, but one of the things that uh, actually HMRC is trying to do more because we think it is an efficient way for us to work as a big department is to act as uh, something of a post box for uh, other government departments generally including the centre because we have an easy and reliable relationship with one of the biggest range of users of services that exist in government so we are trying generally to be able to be used as a post box when that's sensible. So in a number of business related areas, for beers, for camera office and others, we are trying to ensure if they want to use our system that we get information to the right people. Now hang on. Uh, Go on. Not for us, no. Who who paid which budget did this this information come from? It came from HMRC. So the no the the department who wants to get something out um, it has to agree with us how to do that and we will... So we will on this letter, did number 10 pay for it or did you? Um, this, it was not funded from my departmental budget. Um, so Nick, do you know who paid for it? I'm, I'm afraid I didn't receive the letter and I don't know anything about it but well, I'm sure I could write... You know something about I'm it. sure did I you? could write you a letter when I find out who right. paid for it. Well I estimated, it said that 2 million people got this letter um, and that sounds like it's all the employers on your database. Probably, I'd be interested to know. No, it's not. It's not. So obviously, some addresses were selected. No, no. So um, what's the basis on which the selection was made? I think we will have sought to send that to all the businesses we believe could benefit from the new allowance. And just to be clear, this is the employer's NI allowance. And just to be clear, we do spend money, and we yep. did in that case, on um, marketing the new relief so that people know about it. Um, and so we will have paid, as we do with a number of these areas, for advertising, both when a relief is Quite taking money enough. from people Quite and fair enough. But my concern is that this letter uses language which absolutely echoes language which is on the Conservative Party's website. And the government, uh, Cabinet Office guidance on propriety says ministers must ex- ensure that public resources are not used to support publicity for party political service purposes. And it adds, if a pro- pro- proposal is novel or contentious in expenditure, and frankly it is novel to get a letter directly from the Prime Minister... Reference to the Treasury would be expected under the rules in government accounting and the public expenditure conventions generally. Was it referred to you, Sir Nicholas? I'm, I'm not as well informed about this letter as clearly you and Lynn are, and I'm happy to look into it and uh, respond. Well, what I want to know is how the addresses were selected, well, which ones were omitted, I'm how much it cost. It must have cost a million well, pounds of our money to advertise the Conservative Party. Frankly, it's two million businesses, but I'm assuming that you managed to get a decent deal and only spend 50p on each one. Um, And I want to know which department's budget the spending came from. The address was 10 Downing Street. Which department's budget paid for it? So I've already confirmed, and I'll say again, that we will act as communicator with a number of departments. Uh, we will increasingly uh, be able to do that digitally and 
Um, so we've done quite a lot already with biz in this space. Does um, biz use yep. party political phrases uh, well, in its sorry, correspondence? They use our database, which uh, is the, the issue that you asked me. Um, and we do believe that particularly around activity which is um, pr um, focused on businesses, particularly small businesses, that we have a reach into those that many other departments don't have. So we are trying to position but ourselves this is to be your, This is your area. This isn't like some business, you know, this is what we're doing for business. This is a tax relief. You, Lynn, are responsible and for this tax relief. And you would normally expect as has happened, as is described on, in this report, you would normally expect to be the department which communicates it. Why is the Prime Minister, in a personal letter to everyone who pays NLCSs, or a selected a, a group, maybe just those of us who live in marginal constituencies, if it's this political, why is he sending out the letter on it's, your policy? This is a, a government policy which is regarded as being very valuable, particularly for small businesses, and there has been a significant interest in making sure as many people as possible know about it. The intention is that within the first three years of operating this new relief, the hope and expectation is that 90% of businesses will use it. Um, of one, they'll use it. It's 2, 000, five, £3. Well, no, um, I'm afraid you would be surprised how hard we have to work sometimes to get people to take reliefs that are beneficial to them. Um, the anticipation is that it will build up um, to 90%, but we expect it to take three years, and I anticipate we will spend money marketing and communicating that. Lynn, I have no problem with you spending money. I do have a problem with my money as a taxpayer being subsidising mailings which say, we came into government with a long-term economic plan to rescue the economy. I think that is a misuse of public spending. Well, I can assure you that um, I have sought to ensure that what we've done is, is a proper use of expenditure. Well, you're just being uh, a postbox, you're telling me, and Sir Nick is telling me nobody consulted no, with you. No, that's not In what, clear breach of the government propriety. No, uh, I can assure guidance. you that I sought confirmation that this matched government uh, requirements before I was used as a postbox. Okay. Well, well uh, you're writing to it us about that. To me, it seems to me that this is a matter that the um, uh, uh, election commission should be reported to, because I think what I've just done is given, as my tax bit of this, a donation to the Conservative Party. I will simply repeat that I'm content that I followed due process and was uh, uh, given those assurances, but it is my intention that we will be used more widely by other departments in the future. I have no I'm problem friendly. with you being well, used by other there departments. Is, there I is do a have a problem that yes. being abused to put out party political propaganda, well, which in my view this is. That's your view, yes. But it is party political. Well, well, it's actually the Prime Minister saying when he came into power, I'm going to shush you on. Vic is going to write to us about this, and I think Fiona should pursue this as elsewhere as well. I'm going to do some little ones, and then I want a big yes. one. Can I do the little ones, which okay. is arising out of um, this document that I did look at, which is the Office for Tax Simplification. Yeah. There are some idiotic things in there, which I just cannot understand mm -hmm. why you carry on. Can I do luncheon vouchers? Yeah. Luncheon vouchers were introduced in 1946. I sort of remember my dad having them. <laughs> and you got 15p. You got yes. 15p tax free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That has never changed. Why on earth? Why on earth? It's just such, that's you know we talk about complexity. I think we can blame ministers for introducing whole loads of their own uh, ideas. But that is bonkers. Why is that, why is that still around? I, I, Only used by 145 businesses. I thought we did abolish I this. thought that we was one of the ones abolished we after We repealed the tax relief in the Finance Act 2012 yep. and Nick's disregarding regulations with effect from 6th of April oh, 2014. Okay. No, that was OTS. It was on that OTS. That was the one which seems like Angus Jura Bitters That's and Black Beer we also abolished. Yeah, I, had, I, saw, I wasn't going to raise Black Beer because I knew it apologised. Uh, I was talking about... I was hoping about, Mr Mitchell would explain what Black Beer was. But, um, Apparently very few people drink it. What about <laughs> cycle to work days? Have you abolished that one? Um, cycle yes. to work days where usually if you have a meal 
it's counted as a taxable benefit, right? Yes. So, but so if you cycle to work on a cycle to work day, Fiona, you can then <laughs> claim tax relief. But, 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 but this, this, this is, is not something introduced. <laughs> These reliefs were not introduced. This we is were from the Office of Tax No, no, but we are officials. Um, this, this is Parliament. Intri- Parliament enacted these. Uh, yeah, but it's so daft. Why haven't you got it out of the system? It's so completely they daft. But they are now. So all but the four. So, so is this it out list, or in this one? Look, these are out now because this is the list OTS did propose. And with the four, with the exep- exception of the four that Nick listed and four that were partially abolished, and I'm really sorry, I don't know which four those were. The other ones in the list, including Angus Robertis and Black Beer, were abolished. And so, including this one. Yeah. Can I just ask you about late night taxes? Because that does yes, seem to me was. that was. I can mm. see why that was set up. That if people had to work late, it's reasonable to, to, that, they, that they should uh, uh, be able to get home yep. safely. And if that's by taxi, fine. What is so inequitable about this is that it appears to be used entirely by accountants and lawyers and finance houses. And if you happen to be some a shift worker, a nurse, or a cleaner, or a police officer, uh, you're not entitled to it. That's just iniquitous, isn't it? I mean, that's a, a, you know that's everybody a, I mean, an office worker has to get yes. the uh, you know, a, a cleaner. I, I, inevitably. Larger organisations think about this rather more actively than smaller ones. I mean, actually, one of the reasons we didn't actually G for S could think about it if they apply, if they uh, I bet they employ more of the office cleaners. I mean, maybe I've got the wrong one, but those big, you know, they are. The, it's it's the big companies. It isn't a big small company. Nick. I mean, for me, for me, I mean, the treasury analysis at the time thought that this the repeal would risk a disproportionate impact on women in particular uh, and um, might also I think that also our analysis suggested actually the people who, who did benefit from this tended to be um, the less uh, well paid within organisations so for example in the treasury late at night I, mean, I would always get the underground or walk or whatever but I feel I have a duty of care to people many of whom are not paid well all of whom are not paid as much as I am uh, and I think they should be able to get home later. But I don't think that's the case. I mean, again, according to the Office of Tax Simplification, it was primarily the big law firms. And the one law firm, one site, well, major law firm ordered 25,000 late night taxes each year. Extra cost, if no exemption, 150,000. Also, this will be to do with um, where, a, where a company reimburses you expenses. Mm. Uh, mm. It's not classed as a taxable benefit, so I mean that will happen all over the place. It's, it, it? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. The, but, but this is a really good example. This is one of the ones OTS argued should be abolished for the reasons you describe, including that it's uh, not kind of universally available. I almost thought you were arguing to extend it, Chair, which I, I'm sure well, was either not make intended. it fair or get rid of but, it. Once uh, OTS's proposals, when put uh, to, to government, were largely accepted, but those four were not, and they were for reasons of, in the end, the government of the day taking a balance as to whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. And that quite makes the point that tax relief is at its heart a policy decision. It's well, only about the cleaner filling the tax return. It's if the cleaner yeah. gets money for a yeah. taxi. They, they don't She's have not to do taxable it. on it. That's... You know, it's, it's, right. about it's, expenses, it's about It's about whether yeah. the employer actually is a good employer and pays people late at night to yeah. go home. Yeah. Can I ask a bigger one? Patent box. What's the purpose of the patent box? But the, the patent box was designed to encourage um, more innovative um, uh, uh, R&D and development uh, and was brought in um, uh, relatively recently, as you know, and early signs are that it's producing an increased investment in these kind of areas that lead to patents, both from the big companies. So Glaxo uh, have invested at least 700 million specifically as a result of Patent Box and have suggested that's led to 1,000 jobs being created. So have invested how much of them? 700 million. In since. the UK? Yeah. Be fine. And um, 
job, and there are thousands in of jobs the in the UK. But at the other end of the spectrum, Bromptons think it has probably generated about a thousand, a hundred thousand pounds worth of investment for them. So it's designed really to encourage that, you know, new to not just new to market, but new to um, the world ideas, and to get some incentivisation for investment in those, which are by their nature risky. But you things. can get both the R&D tax credit and the patent box, certainly, without the production being in the UK at all, can't you? Um, you the, the rules for both of those will allow um, patents uh, to be established um, in more than one place, but essentially... You can, you can produce it. You can actually just register your patent here and produce your product... Uh, have your have your factory for your product in India, Eastern Europe, anywhere else you like. Well, you know that um, yes. many of our the answer to that is yes, are, isn't it? Well, things do get yes. manufactured all over the world, but yes. there is still a huge value to the UK in owning uh, UK economy and owning the rights to those products. So, when you looked at options, I mean, the, the answer is yes to me, isn't it? You can. I'm not, you know I'm not a, a tax no. expert. I'm sure we can talk to you about patent box uh, if you want to at a later Well, no, you designed it. Uh, between you, you designed it. I don't know who was it, but between you, you were responsible for designing yeah. it. Yeah. And the answer is, if, if, you know, if you're a Unilever, a BT, a Glaxo, Smith, Klein, etc., that, Rolls-Royce, or, uh, uh, um, or any of these companies, you can, uh, you can register a patent here in the UK but you can actually um, have your factory producing the uh, product. Under well, it, it is about, it, it, yes. it, this is about promoting uh, innovation, Maybe creating an environment which is, um, encourages the generation of intellectual property. Um, I mean, to the be design, registered. The design here, features, no. Chair, which you set out were very much, you know, on the face of the policy from the beginning. It's and a, it is it's a about a choice. company in the UK carrying on a genuine economic trade, acti actively Say exploiting. That again. It is about a company in the UK carrying on a genuine economic trade, actively exploiting the patent or its technology. But not necessarily in the UK. Uh, well, it has to be a UK company, a company yeah. in the UK. Yeah, that's that a UK company. Every box they make has well, to be made here. The, and when you were designing it, did you take note of the fact that the OECD thought it was harmful tax practice, that uh, IFS said it's an expensive and poorly targeted policy, that Brussels in their informal non-binding pro found the UK patent box to be harmful and in breach of a voluntary EU tax code? Did you take account of all that? Uh, we, we are working with the EU. They're looking generally at harmful tax practices. They haven't, uh, as far as I'm aware, made a judgment on ours. And I think it would Informal, non-binding pro. And I think it would be very early days to make a judgment on whether this was uh, an approach that was going to work or not. On the targeting question, um, just building on what Chair is saying, would your assessment have uh, evaluated how much relief was going to be given on things that were already happening? I, I'm aware yes. of a tax yes. uh, guy who's going around lots yep. of small and medium-sized companies, getting them to claim against things yep. that... Yep. Um, they and we will have, have. Um, yeah, additionality and dead weight. I mean, anything where you're trying to um, have a behavioural effect, that will be very yeah. central to so, our analysis. So your and your evaluation of the policy then, uh, yeah. as you go forward, will also then look to well, see whether you've got those those assessments right. Yeah. And okay. I just ask a follow-up to that on the question of um, getting companies to take advantage of reliefs that you've created, and the example was given earlier of mm. the National Insurance yeah. a discount for small businesses, and you said to Ms. McTaggart, you'd be surprised how, often it, how difficult it can be. Mm. I think I'm right in saying that lots of companies are now required to do their returns online. Is yes. that right? Uh, some parts of their tax online, yes. yes Would it not be pretty simple to design within that, as it were, a requirement yeah. to test whether they had taken advantage of a particular exemption or discount that you wanted them to take advantage of, and until they'd filled it in, as it were, they couldn't go to the next page. 
Yeah, that's pretty what, easy. Absolutely. And do you do that? Well, we, our systems aren't quite as adept as that. But well, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult. When you fill in anything online to do the most simple thing, well, if you haven't included your postcode or you haven't included a piece of information agreed. that they deem essential, you can't go to the next page. It's not and, and complicated. And so, increasingly, as we design new services, we are trying to design them for exactly that. One, to prompt both for information we want for compliance. So this works at the, the sort of shove end as well as the nudge end, if you wanted uh, to think about it. Um, and we would hope over the next two or three years, we will increasingly be able to personalise both what we tell a small or large company and what we ask of them. So a higher risk company, we might make fill in several more boxes of information. Yes, I understand that, and jolly, jolly and good too. But my question was about these exemptions and releases. Exactly. Just get, would you, do the, would yeah. you prompt them? Yeah to, um, as it were, uh, apply for the exemption you're hoping that they're going to yeah, take advantage of? Yeah, we can have, you know, little very, very specific flags that go, you look like a company that could and should be doing this. Yes. Um, so, that yes. one, and just the straight mathematics, if people have got a uh, national insurance employer's contribution of above 2,000, they get 2,000 knocked off. I mean, how hard would that be? Well, we Do don't really have to tick a box. We don't even have um, online details of all companies. So at the moment, it's not a perfect science. But and you have about this, 80 million, is it 80 million national insurance numbers extant? We have more national insurance more than numbers people. than there are people. Um, and where is the secondary market in this? I mean, where can one go and buy one of these things? <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, I, it exists somewhere. I think turning up for a part time job in a big retail organisation and signing on quickly without giving your full details. You'll remember we've talked about the A another born first mm. of the first 1974. Mm. So if you're hired as casual labour uh, and you've not given all of your details, you'll appear as a new person. Now, RTI, which is still very new, but we think has been quite successful, is really beginning to clean that data up. Mm. And over the next few years, I think we will have a much better database to start with and a much greater ability to communicate once and properly with many more taxpayers, individuals and businesses. That's kind of our dream, really. We're not there yet, but we are trying to design the system with that much more to the front. Can I go back to paper box? Have you therefore got figures um, uh, uh, which are on A, dead weight, and B, potential um, uh, Avoidance and abuse with both. This um, both with both a patent box and actually R and D, the wider R and D as well. We on patent box we haven't had a year yet. No, but you have projections um, on dead weight. Uh, we will have had conversations at the implementation of what we expected. I suspect it would have been on the face of Can, some of the. And do you publish that, Sinek? Do you publish all that stuff? Um, I I can't tell you. Um, offhand what we published. Um, we published the costs. Um, we this was debated. There's quite a lot of consultation, quite a lot of debate. Um, I can get back to you on what we have. Have you published. got it on R&D, which has been around much longer? Um, Do you know what um, dead weight avoidance is on that as a proportion? I don't need to know. You know is, there a, is there a percentage there that you expect... Dead weight to be as a the, the challenge for me is that these are very small reliefs, and so the level of detail we I've got on them here, I'm afraid, is quite is quite small. They're they're probably all going to be in that kind of negligible space we talked about. So, um, of the 101 um, billion that we talked about earlier, um, how much is R and D? Uh, it is a small part of other. Um, so there's 101 billion. I talked about the big four. Um, everything else. Uh, is in other no sorry R&D tax uh, R&D tax credits is 1 billion yeah. of the 101 billion yeah. I mean, so I, it, important but quite small I mean, if we did publish analysis um, I'd be happy to send it to you Thank you. 2005 yeah. or 2010 yeah. on R&D tax yeah. credits I mean, it is something which has been evaluated more, more than, more than many. Yeah. Okay, and let me just ask you a number of questions. I mean, there was the one, the one was Jonathan Bridges' position, Sir Nick, because uh, he came to you from KPMG and helped yep. write the technical rules on on the patent box, yep. and then went back and uh, used, you know, so he helped you write these very complex rules that probably you and I can't understand, with the loopholes in that he then went back and. 
helped his clients exploit. Are you content with that? Well, I, I do think that uh, we uh, can benefit from bringing in professional I expertise. I think a few sort of poachers turn game, gamekeepers can help. And actually, the best example of that is now Lynn's deputy, Edward Troop, who was a tax lawyer for most of his working life and is very good indeed. I mean, look, we have special rules when people come in on SCOM and, uh, in terms of what um, they're allowed to do when, uh, when they return to their um, or organisation. Um, I mean, clearly there's a balance to be struck here. If you, if you prevent them from ever working in that area again, they won't come. On the other hand, what you don't want is sort of on you know day one then being marketed as the person who really understands that. So I, I wouldn't. I know you're onto this. Um, I I'm, I think there is a balance which you can I strike. I agree with you entirely. I don't disagree with anything you've said. I just think it, you know, it would give me comfort actually if you said to me that the way that, that that what happened here was inappropriate. I think just think it was wrong in this instance. And I agree entirely we want to use our experts. I agree entirely that there are perfectly sensible rules that you can devise that uh, ensure that uh, uh, they don't they don't exploit information they garner when they're working with us. But I think in this instance, um, uh, that was not uh, properly abided by. Do you agree with that? Um, well, I don't. Um, but I would need to examine the detail. Um, I thought the amount of publicity he's had, you'd have had his, loads um, of time. That is an avoiding of his answer. Case. But I mean, look, this, is a, this is a generic problem. We have the same with bankers. You know, you want to have really good banking expertise in the Treasury. But they mustn't um, exploit the information they get from the inside to benefit their clients or well, themselves they, on the they, outside. They, they, they it's won't, just they absolute won't. common if it, sense. Well, if they're working in the Treasury, they're not so near the tax collection mm. end that they will really. Understand it. He wrote the rules. He uh, advised the scheme and the rules for the scheme. But, but and think, then I they go back and advertise well, their expertise well, at using the scheme as a means of tax avoidance. Now, is that covered by the rules or is it not? Well, I think this goes back to the point Good. Mr. Bacon made, and that is that we've got to ensure that it's clear to everyone that they can access these new reliefs, which we want to be used. So we're not trying to hide them. We have to make sure that people understand they can access those through any number of routes. It's not very different. Question, question. Is it's it not very different the than the copycat. Is it covered by the rules? Are the rules there? I, we apply well, strict rules about what our secondaries can do. Um, I think no. hyperbole is sometimes a feature of any marketing by anybody. And I think we can balance that by good advice generally that makes sure people understand this. You can't make rules routine. for hyperbole. Um, no, uh, obviously, otherwise, otherwise uh, this committee would be a lot more quiet than it, than it <laughs> is, wouldn't it, Chair? Um, you, you, just, you just have to go with the flow. But, but it's, it must also be true, presumably, that the rules that are made by whomever they're made, when they come into force, are they publicly available to all? And so anybody, including any tax advisor yes. and specialist who spend their whole time studying tax rules, could access them at the same time. Yes. They're equally, avail equally available to all at the same and in, time. And including nowadays, of course, we put the legislation out in draft and we consult very widely we before we do the draft legislation. I mean, my, so only worry, my only worry would be is if someone came in and deliberately constructed the rules right. in, a, in, a, in a way which you could get round them, but then that's actually goes to the integrity of the individual. Um, and so on. Let's cover what happened here, right? That was a simple question. Well, look, I'm, um, I haven't uh, examined the details of this case, but the Treasury has very clear rules on how people should behave. And also, I mean, there are wider business appointment rules. Because um, it's just as possible that some official might leave the Treasury and wash up at, um, at some accounting firm. Out of interest um, on that subject, what is your turnover rate? Because it got up to 24%, didn't it? About <laughs> yeah, here, it's um, it's uh, more in the 15 20% range these days. It's um, still pretty high. It's high, but it's, um, it's, it ensures that we have a healthy ventilation of this the organisation. And the general thing, I mean, I'd like us to look at R&D and patent box. It's one of the areas that I hope <coughs> the Controller and Auditor General might think about, because it just strikes me, 
It's one I've just tended, I've, I've looked at a bit more, and I went on to the net over the weekend thinking, right, what can I find out? And I find these two companies, there's one called Innovation Plus, the R&D tax credit experts, who when you go into about us, you know, what do they tell you? We particular, I'll just read it to you. We particular expertise in software R&D tax claims, and in particular have dealt with a number of cases where clients have been told by other firms that there's no claim and where we've subsequently obtained six-figure amounts for them. Where it goes on later on, where experts in developing and agreeing methodologies with HMRC that allow complex R&D tax relief claims. And then this is the foreign stuff. We often encounter foreign companies who want to know how they can benefit from, benefit from the UK R&D tax relief scheme. Sometimes they have R&D operations in the, cube, off, in, in the UK, often they do not. All that feels to me that you know you set up an R and D tax credit for a perfectly legitimate, but uncontentious political purpose, and it then gets um, exploited. Patent box. When these guys, these guys talk about patent box, they say you should think about which method of calculation of patent box is most advantageous. All this is, you know, I, I, I mean, I accept it's not mega bucks to you, but it's a, it, it, we, it's we, a, it's an, a, it feels to me when I read it just exploiting at the margin of the rules, which t costs us money. It costs oh. us money. Then I've got another Taylor Cox, there's another one that, um, you know, when you look up R&D advice says, um, any good accountant can make you compliant, they say of themselves. What makes us different is that we go further. Well, we'll find innovative ways to reduce the amount of tax you pay. Um, can't read my own writing. Uh, something I, uh, about increasing your I mean, bottom line. They're, they're, so like, they're, like all, they're like all advisors. They're trying to imply that Depending. they know something special, and then the monk will pay million, thousands but your of pounds for their advice. Your response to me suggests that there isn't, and I think my concern, no, this no, is why no, we're no, talking no, about tax relief think, today, is that they provide this I, opportunity for I think, Chair, uh, you're abuse. on to a, a really good point, that there is certain... Um, properties, going back to the, the opening discussion about tax expenditures, things which are credits, um, as we know from uh, our experience with tax, tax credits, credits. Um, will inevitably create more scope at the margin for um, mischief, mischief as, uh, as, as, as Lynn puts it. And um, I mean, you know, we can debate about the precise role of the PAC in relation to tax. Um, but um, if if I was having a work program, I'd inevitably I think have this area um, reasonably high up the agenda. I mean, having said that, um, R and D tax credit is something which has been evaluated more than most. And coming back to our discussion of film tax relief, um, hitherto, despite increasing generosity year by year, because successive governments like to announce um, positive changes in this area. Um, I don't get the impression that this is a, a relief which is out of control. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 it should be of interest to Parliament. It's the, uh, it's the waste issue, isn't it? The report itself says a 2010 analysis showed that a pound relief on this is on R&D, yeah. stimulated three pounds of investment, but had little effect on decisions to engage yeah. in R&D. I mean, that's what the report says. So yeah, but you can say the same thing about married, you know, tax relief for marriage. Um, Indeed. Well, if, if, well, if, if Parliament, Parliament likes well, marriage, it likes R&D. It's the, it's the, it's back to this, so we're not talking about the policy, it's whether the data that you've got and the implementation yeah. shows that the policy is better. Oh, I, I, think, I think it is slightly different. I don't, I think. If, you, if you think there are lots of starry-eyed Treasury officials sitting there thinking, oh, we'll create new relief and this is going to magically change the world, um, I think you don't understand the Treasury. Um, the Treasury yeah. starts everything from a high degree of scepticism. Okay, my very final one is one raised by a colleague of mine, which is this uh, conditional exemption tax incentive scheme, which means you don't pay tax on paint, um, in, uh, paintings, furniture, books, sculptures. And it's about a billion pounds. All these sums, I know they seem relatively small to you, 
when we are here in this committee, look, they, they seem a lot. You no, top no, them no. up. There this are a lot of money. money. And uh, uh, according to, uh, I, have, I have to admit, I picked this up out of newspaper cuttings. According to one of them, constables, Rembrandts, Picasso, Stubbs, fragment of a ribbon worn by Charles I at his execution, which probably ought to be in the House of Commons, really. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, you get this tax relief, you get this tax relief on the basis that you'll allow the public access to it. We, we've just and it just doesn't happen. So we've why on earth are we carrying oh. on with it? Or why don't you mm. look at tightening the rules or making it work? It just doesn't Sorry, happen. what doesn't happen? The access, mm. doesn't it? No. So, so I, I think we have just lost a case concerning mm. the hanging of uh, art on walls, which uh, I think in the most recent case is now regarded as plant and therefore a wasting asset. Um, mm. uh, and we what? do... A constant... Well, this is paragraph 1.32, but the criterion, criterion uh, even though the, the value of the painting so, was going up, it was classified as a wasting asset, yes. But the issue was um, where the stately home was open to the public. That was where the exemption got applied. That's a fairly easy thing to test on. And I, I, and I don't think... That's um, different from this one. Yeah, well, I, I think it... Uh, so the, that access, would be, the access for that which would be the exemption was designed. Where we would Isn't have it? to use compliance work to ensure that um, the conditions of a tax relief are being applied. Across the whole field, there will be people that will try and assert, um, and this is one of the areas that will move avoidance into evasion. And you'll know we've had some recent large successes um, concerning avoidance cases where people have purported to undertake activities is another one in the report around um, uh, a very contrived scheme uh, to allow sideways loss relief and we will pursue those and we'll pursue them as avoidance if it's artificial um, but not untruthful but we will pursue them as prosecutions if people are telling us things that are not true so if someone was claiming a tax relief and we could prove to a court's criminal level of proof uh, that that had been fraudulent, then we could prosecute, and indeed mm. we do. And um, you, put, you put resource into establishing the proof, do you? Yes. Well, you're way behind it. I mean, I, they were just, probably because we're bringing this to an end, you are actually, you know, we should say from this committee, we're really pleased to see that there are more cases going to the court, and that's Good. brilliant. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's very much, you know, testing, <laughs> testing the law is very much where we, where we want, uh, we want to it to be. For effective, it's really good to do that. Seeing your backlog is scary, and just hearing about the film tax relief backlog yes, is, is uh, particularly concerning. It just just shows the enormity of the challenge you've got. And uh, as you know, we'd always support more resources because we think they That's are why I bought excellent value for <laughs> money. For, uh, um, if you, if That's you why they've got off so lightly in recent spending uh, decisions. Yeah. Well, as a sort of, you know, if government were rather more sensitive, it would uh, put money where we could get money back in a more effective way. But I accept again that you've got more people do yeah. doing this work. No, no, I, I think, think we're we, applying them. We well. welcome that as a committee. Okay, has anybody got. Ian, are you all right? Uh, yeah, I'm fine, I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, well, it's a start. I think that was quite an interesting discussion. We are going to not run away from this issue. It's. Uh, um, as you, you understand, and I think we are going to think about what I would have called those tax reliefs which have not a purpose, the ones you call expenditure, quite helpful, or well, uh, maybe we have a different, I understand we have a different understanding of expenditure, but we will be particularly looking at those to see whether or not actually we can put them through a test, even if the government doesn't, if Parliament can, to show that it's uh, a good way of spending money. I don't know whether any of the work any has done has, has got you to think differently, but if uh, I, what occurs to me is ministers go through Treasury at quite a rate. I'm just wondering if they get this kind of management information in order to do their jobs. I mean, because that ought to be one outcome, I would have thought, you know, that, uh, that, it, it that they have a better... Um, I mean, I, um, sorry, I mean, to I mean to extend it, but... Uh, I'm, I'm always stick a fan tip towards this committee, but um, <laughs> so you can you can aim off of what I'm about to say. But I mean, look, I do think these reports and inquiries always, always um, are thought, I mean, genuinely thought provoking and do lead us to do things differently. It, actually, we have been quite lucky on our 
on our leading tax ministers, David mm. Gork, um, mm. who I think is a very fine man, um, has been in post for four years now. So he actually really does yes, understand yeah. HMRC. And um, the um, very the, the excellent Dawn Primarolo did her job for almost, I think for as long as Gordon Brown was Chancellor. So seven years. Um, we've had a good, yeah. good continuity there. But, I mean, not least because of the interest of this committee, I do think we are even more focused on um, the consequences of avoidance um, than we've ever been. It means it's very hard work raising revenue. People, you know, will think of 101 ways to avoid it, but um, we will, with your support, continue to try and um, improve. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.